Dave Van Auken here, the Dave Van Auken Show. The red light is on, Mystic. Red the red light, light is on. Uh, so pumped to have you back. <laughs> One of the real ones in the MMA media space, Mystic Black. My man, how are you? I am doing well, my man. I wore a red shirt just so when you said that, you know, it just kind of matched what you were saying. I knew, I knew what I was doing, but good to be here, my brother. Always good talking to you. Let's get it. Likewise, likewise. All right. So let's, for one, always love talking combat sports, professional wrestling. We always love, we, we can definitely chop it up. But I loved it. You and I had a um, great, fun disagreement over this past weekend. <laughs> UFC Vegas 71. We saw Sergey Pavlovich, uh, let's just say, dismantle Curtis Blades. Another first round finishes. Six in a row for Sergey. And I'm like, man, this guy deserves the title shot. This guy has a legit chance of defeating John Jones. And right away, my guy, I'll let you kind of run with it. You're like, Dave, no, nope, put a cap on it. John <laughs> Jones is the GOAT. So let me let, let, there's the backstory. Take it away, my man. It's cool. I'm seeing all this stuff on Twitter about people just, oh, yeah, Sergey, he should fight for the title. Why is Stipe fighting for a title? Stop. Stop it, people. First of all, we have to talk about Stipe Miocic and how he never got a rematch against Francis Ngannou after he lost to him. They were one and one. I don't care how he lost the second time. Francis got shut out the first time they fought, if we're being completely honest. So he should have got a, a, a trilogy match against Francis Ngannou, and he never got it. Number two, Steve Miocic is possibly the greatest heavyweight of all time, has the most all-time defenses in the heavyweight division. This man has the accolades to deserve a heavyweight championship match, unlike Kobe Covington, who's done pretty much nothing to get a welterweight championship match, but we're not going to get into that. But, Sergey, wonderful performances. Six in a row, as you just said. I give him all the credit for what he has been doing. Curtis Blades is no easy task. Derek Lewis is not an easy task. The, the way he's running through Ty Tuavasa, who's not an easy guy to take out, he took out in the first round. It's extremely impressive. But you know what I want to see? You know what I think he deserves, and we can just decipher it off of here. Sergey Pavlovich versus Cyril Gunn. I know Cyril Gaon had a pretty bad performance against John Jones, but it's John Jones. We can't go based off of that. You know, John Jones has been gone for a long time, but at the same time, that's the GOAT right there. That is one of the greatest of all time. He could take off five or ten years. He's going to come back and be levels ahead of these people. But if we see Cyril Gaon versus Sergey Pavlovich, and, and Pavlovich does the same thing to Cyril Gaon, who's never been finished, uh, never been knocked out before, then you know what? Then I will see the, Ser the Sergey versus John Jones. But for right now... I'm good. Does nothing for John. Zero. It doesn't give him any kind of motivation. He didn't even tweet about it. You know, if John Jones feels a certain way about something, he's going to tweet about it. He said nothing. I don't see it. I don't want it. Not yet. I'm happy you said that because that was actually a part of a little bit of my argument or our debate here. All right. So a lot of great points you said, and I know you're going to come with it. And that's why I wanted us to do this. So for sure. Great points. Let me kind of come back with this one i think what you said i'll lead it with that john jones did not say anything tweet about it talk about it show about it picture about it so to me you ready for this one it's one of those things when i was in the second grade i would run to the girl i like and push her over in, in playgrounds like you would kind of instigate it. i don't think he wants to instigate anything with Sergey pavlovich that's what my experience is <laughs> I think he did throw it out there. It did surprise everyone when he said, hey, I might have one more fight. Let's do a retirement fight, MSG, Stipe, which would be epic, which really be yeah. would be amazing. And I do agree with you. I will say this. If they can lock in, if they, I don't even care how far it is, UFC 292, 293. I know they don't like skipping dates and numbers. But yeah. if they can lock in and have it behind the scenes and go Jones, Stipe, 292 at MSG, I'm cool with that. I really yeah. am. I, I agree with you. I think Stipe... I have debates all the time. I think Stipe is a greater heavyweight than Cain Velasquez. I think he's the greatest UFC heavyweight in the history. Um, and I think Jones and Stipe, it's just one of those fights. We need to see it. We, it is so important for the heavyweight division, probably for its you know legacy part of it. I think we need to see that fight. But second, I want to come back with about is when the UFC is probably its toughest relationship you know, that got to the main stage with was with Francis Nagano. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the heavyweight division's been on stall for a while. Jones is going to come back. Francis doesn't want to do, uh, you know, want to work with the UFC or wants to work with why he wants away. And everything that I hear, this is just stuff that I'm here kind of backstage. Sergey Pavlovich is like, 
the easiest guy to work with. He's kind of like, and I don't know if you saw the post fight interviews. He's kind of like go lucky. He's kind of <laughs> like make jokes. He's kind of like he, he's a funny, socially awkward kind of a guy, which is great. He's kind of like go lucky, and he's just doing work inside the octagon. And a part of me is like the UFC is like. We tried Jones and Stipe a couple of times. We tried it at the end of last year. It was so obvious. That was the fight they wanted to do in December. So obvious. Yeah. This didn't happen. Then I think they wanted to do it early. And I think Stipe said he wasn't ready. He needed one more month. I think they tried. I think the UFC is like, I'm over this. Like, I have problems with Francis. I'm having this with Stipe. I think right now with the irons hot and Sergey with six first round finishes in a row, let's do it. Let's see. And it's, and I know you will love this in the professional wrestling business. When a guy wants to retire, and if John Jones wants to maybe have his retirement fight, you don't do it usually against another old guy. You don't do your retirement fight against a Sting or an Undertaker. You usually do it with Cena did Austin Theory at WrestleMania. You want to give it to the next generation. So I think it's I think it's the right thing to do for John Jones and the UFC is give the next generation of heavyweights the 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 opportunity. And Sergey Jones is hot. I think that'd be a great big main event. There's some other matchups that they can do as well as they're waiting because John Jones is going to fight CB. That's happening. Sergey is not going to sit there and fight nobody, so he's right. got to fight somebody, even a Tom Aspinall. Even Love honestly, it. and and I'm not Mr. Technical here. I'm not here to teach anybody how to strike or any of that jazz. But if we're looking, if we're doing the eye test and we're seeing what Sergey is throwing and how he's throwing, there's a couple guys that would probably put that to rest real quick. Depending on you know who it is, I think Tom Aspinall could do it. I could, I think Jarzinho Rosenstruck can beat Sergey Pavlovich if they were to fight because he's just way more technical. You just have to be technical with a guy like Sergey, and you're good because he's pretty much a berserker. He's like, I'm gonna take whatever you want to my chin, and I'm gonna come right back at you. Right. But at the same time, did you see how tired he was after he had that exchange with Curtis Blades? That's not lasting with a lot of other more technical, more athletic heavyweights. So I think it'd be interesting to see him against some other guys because honestly. I'm not convinced yet. I, I honestly didn't see how tired Sergey was. I saw Curtis Blades laying on the mat, TKO. That's all I saw. That was the end. My, 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 my service went off. UFC Fight Pad, you know, ESPN Plus, it went off. I didn't see that. <laughs> he, was huffing, he was huffing and puffing after that. He, he can't do that with a Tommy Aspen. No, that'd yeah. be pretty, pretty, pretty hard. But I, Sergey's doing awesome right now. So let's see what he's going to do next. All right. So how about this, Mystic? Let's, let's maybe. What great minds come together? Maybe let's 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 try to meet in the middle. How about this? How about November, December when they do MSG? They do Jones Stipe as the main event. Mm -hmm. The co-main event. How about they do Sergey versus Tom Aspinall? Winner fights for the championship, and let's have Sergey as the the third guy. He's the backup. So if something happens, injuries or contract wise, he'll flip in over Stipe or even uh, Sergey Stipe. Something happens for John. Hopefully not. But how about this? Do you agree with that? Let's do Stipe Jones, co-main event, Aspinall, and uh, Sergey. I love that. I okay. love that matchup. I love that co-main event. I'd watch it. I think they're going to do Tom in, in, in the UK when it comes up here in, in July. I mean, it goes over there in July. But that's enough time for him to come back and fight right. in November for a number right. one championship. Because whoever they give him in July, I feel like he's going to be. I, I think Tommy Aspinall is very, very good. One of the like rare, well-rounded well heavyweights yeah. that we have right now in that division. And, and also, I, I go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, I agree with you. And <laughs> with him being in July, the first fight off of an injury, I hope they don't go Aspinall versus Gon or, or Aspinall versus <laughs> Sergey. I hope they kind of lean him back into the division, a Sakai, uh, you know, a, a of, uh, of, of Rosenstrike or somewhere like that, like 10 through 12 in that range. Just a, It's a legitimate fight, but let's get him back in. Let's not throw him against Sergey in July, hopefully. Absolutely. And I just want to say this, too, that I don't know if people are looking at this, but they could have probably did that Jones versus Miocic in July. But I feel that since Stipe didn't want to fight John in September, John's pulling a Stipe. He's like, you know what? You're going to wait for me because John Jones is in no rush to fight. He doesn't have to fight three times a year. He can fight twice a year and be perfectly fine. This man has made millions of dollars in his career. He has no reason to be fighting three or four times in his year in his in his, uh, this year. He can do it whenever he wants. So I think he's pulling one on Stipe, and it's going to be very interesting when that comes about. I like it. I like it. All right. Uh, topic one, I think we debated. I think we both have fun with it. <laughs> topic number two, this is getting to this one. This one, to me, really touches, um, you know, something that you've been pushing on your socials and your channels, which you've been killing it. Everyone, go follow my guy, Mystic Black. 
Falal Muhammad, uh, UFC 288, coming around in a week, week and a half versus Gilbert Burns. It's the co-main event. Uh, I respect so much both men stepped up. Both men maybe didn't even have to, or both men could have waited and kind of pushed it back. They said, no, we're going to put all the chips on the line. And I know you and I definitely both agree the winner of that fight, of course, should fight Leon Edwards later on this year. It does not look like that's going to happen. You mentioned the name Kobe Covington. It looks like that man's next. But this, this is kind of unpack this Bilal Muhammad. A lot of things I agree with you on. There's actually some things I disagree with you because I do like Burns. I think Burns, I, I, I would challenge anyone who puts Bilal's kind of topology <laughs> record to Gilbert Burns. And Gilbert Burns has had this run. He's having a – he could be the fighter of 2023 if yeah. everything falls through uh, the right way. So where are you at in Bilal and Gilbert? I think, first of all, this is the matchup that we needed – from the beginning. I'm not sure why that wasn't made in Miami. I'm not sure why that wasn't made in Brazil. Like a bunch of times that this fight could have happened, but they're booking other things. Respect to Neil Magny, respect to Jorge Masvidal, but Gilbert Burns is ranked very high and that's not the fights that he should be taking. In my personal opinion, it should be, you want to move up. You keep talking title shots, but you keep fighting down. You don't want to talk about rankings, but you keep fighting down. It doesn't make any sense. Bilal is there asking for these fights, telling you that he'd fight. He's taken the fight on two-week notice. You can't tell me that Bilal did not want that fight previously. Literally wanted to be the backup over there in the UK. They chose Colby Covington. Very weird. Don't want to get into that conversation. Don't want to give that man any kind of attention that he does not deserve. Right. But this is the fight that we need to see. In my opinion, this is the number one contendership. I know Kamaru Usman is still that guy. I know he still wants to, to fight. But I think he's going to take some time off. I think he has other things he wants to do. There's movies. There's fashion. He honestly wants to do these other things, and you can kind of see it. He was champ for a very long period of time. Now it's time for these two new contenders, who one of them has had a title shot before in Gilbert Burns. Bilal has never got there yet before, but he's on a long winning streak. And Gilbert is a guy that he can put on his resume, and people can no longer deny if he goes in there and beats Gilbert in any capacity. He doesn't have to KO him. He doesn't have to submit him. As long as he beats him, that man is number one contender, and nobody can deny it. If that being said, that uh, a real legitimate question: If Bilal wins, do you think the UFC next? What do you think Leon Edwards' next opponent is Bilal Muhammad, or do you think they're really going to put their foot down and it's going to be Colby Covington? Leon said that he's going to return in Abu Dhabi, uh, that same card that I think they're going to put Islam on. Yep. And what a better person to put on the Abu Dhabi card than Bilal Muhammad, who has a huge Muslim following. I Great think point. they would go after the Bilal fight. I think it would be even better. And Colby's going to have to sit down for another year because he's making these decisions to not take these fights. I think this is a, a, a situation to where this guy needs a manager because he doesn't have one. He just manages him, his, himself, not taking these fights, thinks he's playing it smart, but he's not playing it smart. So I think they do do Bilal versus uh, Leon in Abu Dhabi. Or if Gilbert wins, they do uh, Leon Edwards versus uh, Gilbert in Abu Dhabi as well. I think Kobe Covington's kind of out of the sweepstakes now, and this is wow. a reason. There, there's a specific reason. They're doing this fight for five rounds because this is championship talk now I almost swore I almost swore there because this just gets me so hot <laughs> <laughs> I love it I love it bring it keep bringing it okay so I like that I have really haven't heard that yet about the Abu Dhabi that makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. also on that card we all assume is the Makochev will be back probably will be the main event of that card do you assume the winner of Charles and Benny at UFC 289 the winner of that fights fights in October in Abu Dhabi if it's Benny a hundred percent it's going to be Benil. if it's Charles I don't see it happening. I think they'll make Charles fight somebody else. They, maybe okay. they'll do a rematch with Poirier. Only if it's Benil, they'll definitely do it. But if Charles wins, you know what I think happens? I know this is going to sound crazy. I see Alex Volkanovski for sure beating uh, Yair in July. And then they'll probably do that part two in Abu Dhabi. Because Alex Volkanovski is such an active fighter. He always wants yeah. to fight at least three times a year. Even though he wants to do four, but he's got to relax sometimes. But he would do it. He would definitely jump for that opportunity. He wants it pretty bad. But I don't think if Charles wins, I don't think they give him another title shot. Just based off the performance he had against right. Islam the first time, it just it just was really bad. Right, right. No, that's a great point. That's a great point. I I haven't really un, uh, unpacked all this like you just did. All that makes perfect sense to me. Because all the time, I agree with what you said. Sometimes when a fight happens, both guys, whoever wins, both things don't happen for each guy. They, they, there's history and there's lineage. 
So like you said, Benny hasn't fought for the championship yet. He's on the biggest win streak of the division. So if Benny wins, he gets it that in October, but not the same for Charles. I like that. I haven't heard that yet. Also on that card, the big rumor, it looks like it's been forever. Chemayev and, um, you know, Paula Costa. I do want to throw this out there. Um, I know that, you know, Connor Chandler, we probably won't get into this on this show. To me, I feel like the UFC has dropped the ball with two guys. They have dropped the ball with Cosmet Chemayev and Sugar Sean O'Malley. I know that big things are set up for both guys, but these both men to me are in the prime of their career, the pinnacle of their career. And I, I don't, I dislike when they really shut down these guys. It's going to be 10 to 12 months before we see O'Malley and Chemayev back fighting. And both guys have been active. It's not like they, they, they like that three times a year. And we love that as fans. So to me, I think they dropped the ball with Sugar Sean O'Malley and Chemayev. Do you agree or disagree? They're definitely dropping the ball with with Hazmat for sure because it's just such a mix of of, of what they're doing. Is he going to be at one seventy? Is he going to be at one eighty five? Dana says no more one eighty five. He says I will fight if you give me a championship at one seventy. I'll make that weight. What are they really doing? And this is a guy who used to be so active per year. Now we haven't seen him since last year when he was supposed to fight Nate Diaz, but he ended up fighting Kevin Holland, and that's the last performance that. Not too many people remember. If I were to ask five people on the street who are UFC fans, who's the last fight person Hazma fought, they probably wouldn't remember or know. And that's kind of unfortunate to even think about right now. And as far as Sugar Sean O'Malley, man is doing, he's such a good promoter of himself. Right. They're never losing there because he's always somewhat active. He's got a show on YouTube. He's always talking about fights. He's always giving his opinion and he's young. That guy is not even 30 years old yet. So I think he's, and he's always training too. And before he fought Peter Yan, he hadn't fought in a while because he came off that that weird fight with uh, Pedro Munoz. But he right. still came back, had a pretty impressive performance against Peter Yan, no matter if whoever thinks he won or not. It still was impressive against a guy like Peter Yan. I think it's smart what they're doing. They're having this fight with Al Jermaine Sterling and Henry Cejudo. And whoever wins that fight is going to fight Sugar Sean O'Malley. And they know it's going to sell. That's the thing. That man sells. I think, and I'm gonna. this is going to be a wild prediction that Sugar Sean O'Malley will be a person that will sell a million pay-per-views in the UFC. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. All right, one last thing for you, Mystic, a fun last little back-and-forth debate. Uh, the one thing I love with Fight Bananas and our socials and our, our our outlets, right, that when we post stuff, we see the metrics and the analytics, what people post back and they comment or what people like and share. It's great because it for us, I know what to talk about, what people want to talk about, if that makes yeah. sense, right? So this morning, actually, Fight Bananas put up something about Aljamain Sterling and about if he beats Henry Cejudo at UFC 288 in Newark this uh, next coming up week, is he the greatest UFC bantamweight fighter of all time? Would that really put the cherry on top? Is he the greatest ever? And I thought it would be... 50-50. I thought more people would be yes, because sometimes we're so into this hyperbolic media. What's the best thing we just ate? That's the best lunch we ever had. And I was blown away about the negativity about zero chance, no way, actor, all this kind of nonsense to me, which Al Jermaine doesn't deserve. I do think he's one of the best bantamweights I've ever seen. And if he defeats Henry Cejudo, there's not a lot more like People are in the in the chat. I saw Cejudo. I saw um, uh, uh, TJ Dillashaw, and I saw Cruz. Aljo would have beat two of them. So I think if he wins, I, it's hard to disagree. What do you think? Where is he on the bantamweight goat list? In respect to Aljamain Sterling, for sure, he's done a lot of things in that weight class, especially before he came became champion. And that's my point right there. Before he became champion, because. As he became champion, how many title defenses does he does he have? Like truly defenses, I would give him the the um, Dillashaw and Peter Yan for sure. That's two title defenses. Yep. If you look at Cruz Dillashaw, you go into that kind of realm of those champions. Those guys are way steps ahead of Aljamain, unfortunately, especially the way that Aljamain's been winning as well too. It's not like the Peter Yan fight. Was it? Was he? Did he have a good performance? Yeah, he had a good performance, but he took off like two rounds in that performance. I don't remember watching a TJ Dillashaw title defense and he's taking off rounds against his opponents. No, there, there are a lot more impressive performances. Same thing with Dominic Cruz. Dominic Cruz is a workhorse, different kind of guy. Not to say he was finishing everybody, but that man never took a round off. So for me, Aljamain has to have one of the most impressive performances against Henry Cejudo for him to be solidified in like one of the greatest bantamweights of all time. Is he in my list? Not yet. 
there's some things I feel like he needs to do as a champion, not to say what he did before a champion, but as a champion. And maybe he can get to that point. But I just, I can't, that's, mm, if I see this more in a sense of Henry Cejudo wins this, yeah. He is right there of greatest bantamweights, greatest fighters of all time. We got to put a lot of respect on that man's name, especially if he comes back after that long of a layoff right. and takes the, the belt from Aljamain. That'll be crazy impressive. I, I totally agree with you on the Suhudo side. If Suhudo wins this fight, him and Mighty Mouse, to me, are become the two greatest lower weight fighters in the history of mixed martial arts, one and two, and you can debate that. Back to uh, Aljamain just real quick. I think... Yeah. If he defeats Cejudo, I think to me, he's probably right there. And then maybe the icing on the cake, maybe that last layer is the defeat of Sugar Sean O'Malley. I think O'Malley will have a great career. I think O'Malley's name is so big and polarizing. A win over O'Malley would do wonders for Aljamain Sterling. Because that's like, if he wins this fight, Peter Yan was the champ. Then he yeah. defeated the old school Dillashaw, even, you know, an all-time great as Cejudo. And then the new school O'Malley, like he would have all this wrapped into one. Um, you know, I think Aljamain has a shot. I really do think he has a shot. I actually am picking him to defeat Henry Cejudo next week. Ooh. I think he's going to get the job done. I really do. I was going to wait till next week to, well, I'm going to still drop a video no matter what, but this is going to be one of those things where I said it, it's not even going to be close. It's not even going to be close. Aside yet, or you're going to wait for next week? Is that that's a teaser? That's a teaser. No, no, no I'm, I'm going to give you a little little preview. Is that and... this big man with the mask off? It was <laughs> me. Austin. It was me. It was me. This is going to be something to where there's one person who does something way better than the other, and there's no way he's going to do that to that person. That's all I'm going to say. That's all. I'm going to leave it there. Right. I'm going to leave right. it there. But I, I'll I'll drop some next weekend. We'll talk about it some more. We'll do this again if you want to do this again. Hey, hey, you know me, man. Anytime. We always love having you on. Uh, floor is yours. Anyone of socials or any kind of stuff you want to plug, push away, do it. Appreciate it. We went through Sergey. We went through Bilal. We had a little Aljo talk. I thought it was 20 minutes of gold, my man. Hey, my man. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, you know I'm always here to do one of the best shows on YouTube. You see where I'm at. You follow this man, Dave Adok and Fight Bananas. They are doing work from years and years that I've followed this page. Make sure you guys are following them. I appreciate you, my brother. All right, my guy. Be good. We'll talk to you soon. Give a follow to our guy, Mystic Black MMA and IG. You got to get it. All right, guys. See you later.